Hey everyone, Cool Kid here. I'm not gonna do some fancy intro for this one. Warframes have passive abilities. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, and I want to talk about it. I do want to lay down some ground rules before we start though, just to make things clear moving forward. First and foremost, this is all my opinion, not by any means objective fact. I created the original tier list with my stream chat and ran it by both Nova Umbral and Sabuchi to get more perspectives, but at the end of the day it's still ultimately my own thoughts and feelings. I'll do my best to explain why I feel the way I do, and you are entirely welcome to disagree and make your feelings known, just please be civil about it. When it comes to actually tiering these passives, I'm primarily considering two things. The raw power of the passive, and how well it works within the Warframes kit. It's important to keep in mind that passives only exist within the context of a Warframes kit, so even if one isn't strong in a vacuum, it could still be very strong in practice because it plays off of the rest of the frame's abilities. I will also bring up when a passive is particularly good for Helminth abilities, as that absolutely is worth considering, but a lot of my thoughts come from an analysis of the base kit. This tier list is also going to make absolutely no statement about the Warframe as a whole or their overall viability, just their passive. Alright, one more thing. Passives that come from augments, like Valence Formation, Rebel Heap, and Biting Frost, aren't going to be counted. Considering those come from optional mods, I don't think it's fair to put a frame high up because of them. I will bring them up when relevant, but it won't influence their positions on the list. Okay, with that out of the way, I want to establish that the tiers are not ordered. For those who don't know what that means, on some tier lists the individual tiers are to show not only a comparison of things between tiers, but they also compare things within the tier itself. So for example, if I put a character earlier in a tier, they're considered high in that tier, and later in that tier is lower. So up here Excalibur would be high A, and here he would be low A. He's still A tier either way in this example, but he's considered better or worse than other things in the same tier. For this tier list, everything in a given tier is just that tier, with no statement as to their relative power intra-tier so as to not make things more complicated. This is already in the weeds enough, okay? I don't want to work on this for another month. Alright, beyond all that, I want to explain what each tier actually means. So starting at the bottom, F tier is for the absolute worst. They either don't do pretty much anything, or the effect is so weak that they are effectively non-existent. D tier is for passives that technically do something, but their impact is very limited. C tier is generally for passives that enable niche strategies or have severe flaws, something that's not exactly bad, but is either optional or just overshadowed. B tier is for passives that are good, usually nice to haves that are always helpful but nothing crazy. A tier is for great passives that are often a large part of the frame's kit or just powerful by the numbers. Lastly, S tier is for the absolute best of the best. One so strong it can be worth playing a character purely for their passive, or that passive is an inseparably huge part of their kit. Also, just as a fun thing, I'm going to make suggestions for improvements to any passives in D tier or below. Anything C or above I think is more or less fine as is. Alright, with the whole page of exposition out of the way, let's get into it. We're gonna do the frames not alphabetically but by the release order on the wiki, as that way it's easier for me to keep the pinned comment updated with any new passives, and also my brain just likes it that way. So, first up, let's start with the game's poster boy, Excalibur. Excalibur's passive is that sword weapons deal 10% increased damage and have 10% higher attack speed, both additive with mods. What the game considers a sword is pretty narrow, and it counts the following weapon types. Swords, obviously. Dual swords. Rapiers and Nakanas, as well as Exalted Blade. It's important to note that several weapons you might intuitively think would count, such as machetes, heavy blades, and dual Nakanas, do not count for this passive. Even beyond that though, 10% is a very low bonus, especially with it being additive with mods. With it being both so niche and so minor, we're starting off strong with Excalibur in D tier. It does do something for him, and it is always useful so long as you're using Exalted Blade, but it's just really small. So how would I improve this passive? Well, in a few major ways. My first would be to make it apply to all melee weapons, not just swords. Excalibur is a great melee platform on account of things like Radio Blind and Furious Javelin, so limiting his passive to swords just feels arbitrary. Beyond that, the bonus should be increased to something more substantial, like 25% or more. My biggest suggestion for Excalibur, though, is to add a new effect to his passive. Melee hits gain 2% lifesteal. My reasoning for this is because Excalibur struggles considerably in Steel Path level content on account of his low survivability. You can solve this using a Helminth, using items like Healing Return or Arcane Reaper, or even just spamming Radio Blind, but it takes a lot of effort to keep him alive, which is a huge weakness, 
The 2% lifesteal with melee should help fix this crippling issue, along with promoting his already existing playstyle of being an aggressive, hard-hitting melee character, while not being so powerful in the early game that it makes things too trivial. Most of my passive suggestions moving forward are just kind of out-of-pocket ideas I'm throwing out there for fun, but I feel very strongly about this one. Please, DE, give Excalibur lifesteal with melees, it would help him so much. Trinity Trinity is able to revive allies 25% faster and from 50% farther away. And that's it. This is helpful if an ally goes down, sure, but it's entirely contingent on that actually happening, and if you're doing your job as a Trinity, it really shouldn't be. Considering you can give allies 75% damage reduction and restore all of their health and shields with one button press, this passive feels like a buff to your worst case scenario. This also does very little if you aren't in a team, though it does work on things like companions and rescue targets, which does give it some use in solo. So, unfortunately for Trinity, she gets to live in D tier with Excalibur. It's kind of a nice to have, but you really shouldn't be taking advantage of it if you're playing well, which as Trinity is really not that hard. As for a suggestion to improve this passive, it's honestly kind of tough to say, especially because Trinity's light rework is around the corner, but I'd personally keep it as is just to not mess with anyone who likes it. Beyond that though, there's a lot that could be added on top of the existing effect that fits her support theme. Maybe she could double affinity range for allies to boost her forward's effect range, maybe enemies who attack her could have their damage reduced to assist with tanking, maybe she could even get some kind of buff whenever she heals or revives an ally. Nova Umbral also suggested that maybe she could grant her team a periodic death gate, kind of like Phoenix Renewal does on Oberon. I don't know, there's a lot of options that fit with Trinity because her concept and kit are just so simple. We'll have to see if they mess with the passive in 1999, but for now, she's down in the D tier. Ember Ember's passive grants her a buff called Conflagration, giving her 5% more ability strength for every enemy with at least one active heat proc in a 50 meter radius. Considering that nearly all of Ember's abilities inflict heat, this passive allows her to get a lot of power strength for just using her kit. This enables a lot of interesting things, like allowing Ember to run lower power strength and letting her passive pick up the slack or using the passive to really beef up helmet abilities that need a lot of strength, like Roar or the Slow on Gloom. It is worth noting that, at low levels, this passive doesn't really function as enemies die too quickly, but at Steel Path level, Ember can easily get huge boosts to her strength for doing nothing special. Normally, this strength boost only really affects her Fireball and Inferno, but things like Fireball Frenzy and almost any helmet make it really shine. I'm putting this one in A tier, a valuable tool that enables a lot of interesting and powerful strategies while also rewarding Ember for casting and using her abilities frequently. Mag Mag's passive grants her a pickup vacuum, pulling in items within 8 meters of her. This sounds pretty good, and early on in the game it can be, but it suffers from one huge problem. If the mods Vacuum or Fetch are equipped on her companion, this passive is completely overridden. The effects of the mods and passive don't stack. Instead, the higher value takes priority, and as Vacuum and Fetch are both higher range than Mag's passive, it just gets turned off. You could argue that this can save you a mod slot on your companion, at least if you're okay with the sizable loss in Vacuum range, but does anyone actually play like that? I mean, I imagine many of you are just now hearing about this passive not stacking, but now that you do, are you really gonna make configs on your companions that don't use Vacuum or Fetch specifically for Mag? Even beyond that, Vacuum is 11.5 meters, which is around 44% more range than this passive, and Fetch is 13.5 meters, which is around 69% more range. So basically, to make this passive function at all, you either have to reduce the range you could be getting from a very cheap companion mod, or just not bring a companion at all. Yeah, I'm putting this one as our very first F tier. It's completely turned off by some of the most common and useful mods in the entire game, and if you opt to not take those mods, you're putting yourself at a sizable disadvantage via the reduced range. My suggestion to improve this passive? Well, we could make it so that the range does stack, which would be a pretty easy fix. I know it's lazy and not all that creative, but I do still think it would help her out. We could also give the base range of the passive something higher than those two mods, just to make it so that she can actually utilize it and save the companion mod slot more viably. Loki Loki's passive grants him a 10 times longer wall latch duration, making it go from 10 seconds to 60 seconds. Now, honestly ask yourself, have you ever been in a scenario where you've needed to wall latch for an entire minute? The only time I've ever found this passive useful was avoiding Jackal's grid wall attack, and there are so many other ways to cheese that fight that it's hardly a legitimate use. Typically the only reason you'll be wall latching is to either trigger Arcane Arachne, or on accident. Or to do a wall attack, baby, let's go wall attacks! 
Regardless of that though, Warframe is a fast-paced game that encourages you to move around a lot, and wall latching really doesn't gel well with that gameplay. I don't think the mechanic should be removed or anything, it does have some niche uses, but having a passive built around it doesn't really make much sense, especially when it comes to just making it longer. Nothing in Loki's kit benefits from it, the game discourages being stationary, and there's no real incentive to wall latch for that long to begin with. So, just like Mag, this one's going in F tier. You, uh, you might notice a trend here. Lots of older Warframe passives aren't that great unless they've been reworked. So, how would I improve this one? I'll admit I don't play Loki a ton, but I do have a suggestion. If an enemy is under the effect of one of Loki's abilities, like being drawn to a decoy or disarmed, they should take bonus damage, maybe something like 25 to 50 percent, and this bonus would be multiplicative. Basically, think Voban's passive, which we'll get to in a bit, but for enemies under Loki's effects. This would also work if they were tricked by other sources such as Radiation or Chaos, or disarmed from things like Hounds or Halakar, and it'd grant Loki a helpful boost in damage while keeping his kit's fundamental goals the same. Volt Volt's passive is the Static buff, where he gains 10 damage to a static charge for every meter he travels. This buff stacks to 1000 damage, which is unleashed on his next attack as pure electric damage, and this goes for weapons and abilities. That sounds decent, and it definitely is in the early game, but it has several drawbacks that become more apparent later in the player's progression. For one, this damage bonus is flat, meaning it isn't affected by things like base damage or elemental mods. It also only affects one hit, so even if you have multi-shot, only one bullet will actually deal the bonus damage. It is affected by critical hits and the shot combo mechanic from sniper rifles, and it doesn't combine into other elements, both of which are nice, but as you get high in level, it isn't really that impactful. I have heard that there are some niche strategies that can make this passive work in higher end content, but for the vast majority of people it won't be worth considering past the first few planets. All that considered, I'm putting it in D tier with Excalibur and Trinity. It does technically do something for Volt, and that something is valuable early on, but as you progress that 1000 damage will just mean less and less. How would I improve this passive? I'd just let it scale with damage and elemental mods, or maybe make it apply to all hits if the attack has multi-shot. I think this would keep it much more relevant and make building up big static damage a more important part of Volt's gameplay loop in the late game. Rhino Whenever landing from a height that would incur a hard landing, Rhino emits a 6 meter shockwave that deals 300 impact damage and knocks down enemies. It's… it's literally just heavy impact. These two things do actually stack, but that's not that meaningful because they're both genuinely terrible. Getting high enough to incur a hard landing isn't really that easy on some tile sets, but even beyond that, knocking down enemies in a 6 meter radius just isn't that helpful, and the 300 damage is a joke. Beyond that, Rhino also has access to Rhino Stomp, which just blows this passive out of the water. Unfortunately for Rhino, this one's another F tier. The effect is virtually never useful. My suggestion? Considering that armor is such a big part of Rhino's playstyle, I think his passive should revolve around it. As an example, maybe he could gain armor for every enemy within a certain radius of him, or maybe getting kills grants him an escalating armor buff, you know, something like that. This would help him set up for iron skin more easily and reinforce his identity as a tanky character, especially if he could share the buff with allies. Ash Ash's passive makes it so any slash status effects he inflicts deal 25% more damage and last 50% longer. The duration bonus stacks additively with status duration mods, and the status damage bonus is additive with status damage mods, which is noteworthy as the status damage stat is multiplicative with faction damage mods, allowing for some very big bonuses when the two are combined. The extra duration isn't amazing, considering that the normal duration of a slash proc is 6 seconds and you really should be killing things faster than that most of the time, but because bleed damage is only a 35% multiplier instead of a 50% like other DOTs, and it isn't affected by a weapon's actual slash damage or slash mods, the 25% damage boost goes a long way. Honestly, prior to the Jade Shadow's armor changes I would have put this passive very high, as slash is one of the few ways to deal with armor efficiently, but now that armor has a cap of 90% damage reduction, slash has kind of begun to fall behind. Don't get me wrong, it's still an extremely powerful status effect, but as time has gone on, easier access to armor removal and partial stripping becoming more effective has led to it feeling less needed, on top of armor just being less of an enemy's total EHP in general. Still, this passive helps enable Bladestorm's whack-ass damage numbers and is great for a lot of force slash weapons, like Scythes, namely Harmony. The only thing that makes this passive not A tier or higher for me is the fact that the game has just kind of moved away from the era where Slash was at its peak. As such, I'm going to be putting it in B tier. It's a great passive and can play into some powerful strategies, but it's not as powerful as it used to be because armor is just less oppressive now. Frost Now finally leaving the original 8, we have Frost, whose current passive is actually pretty new. 
It works in two parts. The first and simplest being that all cold procs inflicted by Frost have 100% more duration, which is helpful as all of Frost's abilities inflict cold. The second part is that, for every enemy within 15 meters of Frost with at least one active cold proc, he gains a stack of Fortifying Freeze, with each stack granting him 50 armor. On paper, this is nothing fantastic, as the range is pretty short and Frost is usually pretty cozy either inside his bubble or under layers of Overguard, but this passive has some synergy with both of these things. You see, Frost's Snow Globe health actually scales based on his armor, and the Overguard from Icy Avalanche grants bonus Overguard based on Frost's current armor count for the first time it hits an enemy. These aspects grant Frost some interesting choice regarding his passive, where he might want to wait to use Avalanche so he can spread cold for a higher armor bonus, or spread as much cold as he can for more bubble health. Because of these synergies with his two strongest defensive tools on top of longer crowd control and a general increase in tankiness, I'm putting his passive in B tier as well. These are both solid effects, nice to have, and it plays into his kit, but it's by no means character defining. Nyx Nyx's passive is that enemies are 20% less accurate when targeting her, effectively granting her a 20% boost to her evasion, which is a hidden stat that, as you might guess, affects enemy accuracy when targeting the player. As you might also guess, this is rarely actually noticeable, though it can be stacked with other sources of evasion like the Sly Vulpophila to become more helpful. Because of that, you might think I'm going to slot this passive in D or even C tier, but I'm not. You see, the problem for this passive is actually Nyx's other abilities, which makes it not helpful much of the time. To explain what I mean, whenever Nyx casts Chaos, enemies under the effect are given a maxed out threat level. What's a threat level? Well, when it comes to enemies attacking things in Warframe, they'll prioritize targets with the highest threat level as best they can. Because of this, if Nyx is using Chaos, enemies will almost always prioritize targeting each other over her, so the reduced accuracy isn't really needed. I say almost always because, barring some exceptions with Nyx being closer than any other targets and whatnot, using Absorb actually gives Nyx herself a maxed out threat level, so enemies will prioritize shooting at her. These two things make the passive pretty much worthless, and if you're using Assimilate so you can become a walking tank, then it is genuinely entirely worthless. As such, I'm putting it in F tier on account of it being all but neutered by Nyx just using her abilities. Maybe you could put this in D, but I don't personally think it's even that good. How would I improve it? Well, I think we should keep it for those who like the evasion shenanigans, but I also want to play into Nyx's psychic theme more. My idea is that, if Nyx is aiming down her sights, she's able to see enemies through walls with a highlight, kind of like the Amalgam Arganac mod. On top of that, she'll be able to read their mind, which shows their future movements. She could also maybe see weak points on enemies that only she can take advantage of due to her psychic powers. Or she could just do this. Blows up mine with mine. My fucking mine. I don't know. Hopefully DE gives her something better than I can with her light rework in 1999, but for the time being, she's an F tier hell. Banshee. Banshee's passive silences all weapons she has equipped, as well as any weapons her companion is using. This enables some interesting and even normally impossible combinations, like silencing gun blades or explosives. Some might say that this passive isn't useful because of Banshee's own silence ability, but as far as I'm aware, that only makes enemies take longer to respond to gunfire, not fully silencing weapons. This lets Banshee save a mod slot on her or her Sentinel's weapons if she wants to do stealth, but more importantly, it lets her do some cool stuff, like gunblade stealth or focus farming with explosive weapons and the stealth kill affinity bonus. Simple, but interesting, and relatively effective, though I will concede it doesn't really have a ton of synergy with the rest of her kit. It's also not really that effective in game modes where conventional stealth isn't an option, like survival or defense. As such, it's going in C tier. It enables some niche strategies and is nice to have, but it can be ignored if you don't want to play into it. Saren. Saren's passive grants her 25% more status duration on all status effects she inflicts. This sounds alright at a glance, but it kinda of falls flat when you consider how little it really helps Saren. You see, Saren is a character that does a very good job at killing lots of enemies. This is relevant because most status effects have a duration of 6 seconds, and Saren really should be killing enemies faster than that a lot of the time. Some status effects buck that trend, like Corrosive being 8 seconds and Radiation being 12, but that doesn't mean much to Saren. She does inflict Corrosive with her spores, but they apply Corrosive so frequently that the extra duration doesn't really matter as the spores can typically replace the old Corrosive stacks faster than they decay. I feel that status duration in general is a stat that's mostly useful in a few specific contexts, like prolonging crowd control from cold and radiation, as well as making gas clouds linger longer. Saren doesn't really have access to any of those status effects, and the ones she does have access to are either self-sustaining or should be killing things before 6 seconds passes. All that considered, I'm putting her in D tier, 
technically does something, but just isn't that useful for Saren herself. How would I improve it? Personally, I'd make it so anytime she applies a status effect, she has a random chance to apply another stack of that status effect. So, say maybe she inflicts a toxin status, and then there's like a 25% chance it'll be duplicated and another identical toxin status will be added. It would also be cool if she had a passive where if she inflicts two different primary status effects, they'll combine and trigger a stack of their combo status. These both might honestly be overpowered, or equally worthless, and Saren is still very good in spite of her weak passive, but I think these concepts would at the very least work into her playstyle better. Vobin Vobin's passive grants him 25% more damage to any enemy who is incapacitated by his abilities. To make it clear what this actually means, any enemy who is either latched by his Tesla Nervos, pulled by his Tether Coil, suspended by Bastille, or being pulled by Vortex receives the 25% damage increase. Now, this isn't amazing on paper, but this passive is actually very strong because of a little math quirk. It's a multiplicative damage boost that multiplies with other multiplicative damage sources. To explain what I mean, in Warframe, there are two ways that damage boosts are usually handled, additively with mods or multiplicatively. Generally, additive bonuses are worse due to a concept called relative change, or as the community often calls it, diminishing returns. To make this easier to understand, let's do a hypothetical. Say you have a weapon that deals 100 base damage, and you add a mod that increases that weapon's base damage by 100%. We'll call this mod Damage A. This doubles the base damage of your mod, resulting in 200 damage, so you've doubled your damage. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. So, let's add another mod, which we'll call Damage B, and what you'll find is things start to get interesting. If this mod is additive with our other base damage mod, then it adds with our previous 100% damage bonus, meaning you get a damage boost of 200% in total, which is 300 damage. So, that's also pretty simple, but as you might notice, this is only 50% more damage than our previous 200, and as you keep stacking mods that are additive, you'll keep getting less and less relative change. So, if we had a damage C mod that was another 100% more, we'd be at 400 damage, which is only a 33% increase. Add a damage D and we get 500 damage, which means it's only adding 25% than we had before, and so on. But if we go back to damage B and make it multiplicative, it multiplies our damage after the base damage mod is considered, giving us 400 damage. For this reason, multiplicative damage bonuses are generally better than ones that are additive with mods, though you still want base damage in some capacity to give that multiplier a higher number to work with. So, your damage is boosted by 1.25 times against incapacitated enemies. That's solid, but this has another special attribute to it. Typically in Warframe, sources of multiplicative damage are additive with each other, but Vovan's passive multiplies with other multiplicative sources. So, as another example, let's have another 100 base damage attack. Say we have the passive active, and we also have a base roar buff. If these two buffs were additive, then the passive and roar would add together before the damage is applied, meaning we get a final multiplier of 1.75 times, or 175 damage. But these bonuses multiply together, meaning that you first multiply the damage by roar, and then you multiply that new value by the passive, resulting in 187.5 damage. At this small scale, that's not a huge increase, but when working with larger numbers, this is hugely important. Okay, so it's multiplicative with other multipliers, that's cool, but wouldn't that require a helmet like Roar? Well, no actually, as Voban's own Overdriver buff is also a multiplicative damage boost, so you can multiply the two together, resulting in surprisingly large boosts to Voban's damage. This is made even better by Flechette Orbs benefiting from both buffs, resulting in a hefty damage increase for those two. Not to mention that, if a damage overtime effect was inflicted on an enemy while they were incapacitated, the passive bonus applies twice and multiplies with itself. Okay, I know that was pretty technical, but my goal here is to lay out my argument for why this 25% multiplier is actually much better than you'd think at first glance, and Voban gets it just for using his abilities. So, this one's an easy A tier for me. Plays well with Voban's kit, and has unique properties that make it very good when you know how to use it. Nova Nova's passive knocks down enemies in a 6 meter radius if she herself is either knocked down or self-staggered, dealing 250 blast damage. This does have some funny gimmick setups with stuff like Arcane Eruption, but it doesn't really synergize with Nova's kit at all, and is just really weak by itself. On top of that, if you have any form of status or knockdown immunity, the passive just doesn't ever activate. This passive really just makes being knocked down a slightly less awful position to be in, but knockdowns are easy enough to turn off or counter that it's just not really that helpful. With how slow Molecular Prime makes enemies, it's not that uncommon that whatever knocked her down can't even hit her before she gets back up especially if she tech said knockdown, 
Oh yeah, for those who don't know, when you get knocked down, your Warframe will flash briefly, and if you press jump during that window, you'll actually get up faster. This does have a bit of synergy if you consider that slowed enemies are knocked down for much longer, which is very beneficial, but the 6 meter radius and finicky activation condition make the synergy difficult to take advantage of. Yeah, this one's an easy F tier. Doesn't mesh with the kit all that much, really weak by itself, and it's easy to turn off. To improve it, I'd make it so Nova releases this knockdown wave in a much larger radius and under some other activation condition, like maybe whenever she casts an ability. This way, the knockdown would affect more enemies much more frequently and synergize better with Molecular Prime. Necros Necros's passive grants him and his companion 5 health for every enemy that dies within 10 meters of him. As you might notice right off the bat, 5 health is a really small number, all things considered, and 10 meters is also a very short range. The bigger issue this effect has, though, is that Necros has Desecrate, which makes his body a machine that turns corpses into health orbs. This also gives Desecrate synergy with health orb-oriented buffs like Yellow Shards and Health Conversion, making it outpace the passive very quickly and easily. Considering how little health Necros gets and with it being in such a small range, on top of the fact that Desecrate is a solid healing tool already, I'm putting this passive down in D tier. It does do something, and it's still some healing, it just doesn't really mean much. When it comes to improving it, I think it would honestly be solid if they bumped up the healing and range, but Desecrate would still make it less relevant. Nova Umbral suggested maybe making his abilities use health, basically like a built-in despoil, which could also be really neat. As it stands though, this passive is hardly noticeable. Nearly an F, if I'm honest. Valkyr Valkyr's passive has two effects tied to it. She's immune to hard landings, and she recovers from knockdowns 50% faster. Hard landings are already incredibly easy to avoid, as all you need to do is roll or slide while hitting the ground to not take the stagger, so that's already not particularly helpful. The 50% knockdown recovery is honestly not a bad effect, but somewhat similarly to Necros, this passive suffers from the fact that it's on Valkyr. What do I mean by that? Well, Valkyr has access to Hysteria, which makes her immune to status effects, including knockdowns. While this does vary from player to player, Valkyr will generally be in Hysteria very often, meaning she doesn't get to benefit from her passive because the condition to trigger it never even activates. Similarly to Nova, this passive also doesn't do anything if Valkyr has some external form of status or knockdown immunity, making it really easy to ignore. There are some Valkyr strategies that don't live in Hysteria, like using the Enraged Augment or focusing on Warcry as a boost for a normal melee. But even in those contexts, the faster knockdown recovery is more of a nice to have than some huge boost. All that considered, I'm putting it in D tier. Not a terrible effect, but Valkyr often isn't even susceptible to knockdowns, and even when she is, it's not really that big of a deal. As for improvements, once again your boy Nova Umbral had a really neat suggestion. Give Valkyr a buff based on the number of slash procs she inflicts on an enemy. This could be something like attack speed, damage, there are plenty of options. And while I do think this would require a tweak to Hysteria to make it more Slash-focused instead of an even IPS split, I still think it's a good idea. Oberon Oberon's passive grants all companions a 25% health, shield, and armor link, with these being additive with their respective link mods. In addition to that, Oberon's own companion also gets one instant revive permission, where if they die, they'll instantly get back up with no timer. This passive is interesting because the game has really just moved past it being useful. Back before Abyss of Dagath, when pets being dead meant they were out for the whole mission, it was nice to give them a free second chance, but now that they'll revive themselves autonomously, it just isn't nearly as helpful. Add to that that several bond mods make companion recovery faster, in addition to other useful effects, and it's just hardly noticeable. The small link boost is nice, but it's not really enough to make a measurable impact in most cases. Oberon also doesn't really have a kit geared towards companion synergy, the only real exception being Renewal, which heals them, and has Iron Renewal, which applies bonus armor, as well as his weed carpet making them status immune, I guess, implying they decide to actually stand on it. Considering the fact that companions will increase the energy drain on Oberon's 3, though, you can genuinely argue that they might actually be a detriment in some cases. So, as much as I do love Goat Bro, he's going into D tier. The buff does do something for him, it's just not that valuable, especially after all the companion overhauls. How would I improve it? Well, considering that Oberon is a Paladin-type character, I think it would be cool if he got a stacking damage buff every time he buffed an ally, either by healing them or making them status immune or what have you, up to a cap. This would actually encourage companion synergy purely by having them count as an ally for the purposes of the buff, which would make having one much more relevant for the passive. This would also help bolster the somewhat neglected damage portion of Oberon's support-slash-damage hybrid theme. Zephyr 
Like Valkyr, Zephyr's passive also works in two parts. While Airborne, Zephyr has 150% more critical chance for all of her weapons, which stacks additively with crit chance mods. In addition to that, she also has very different airborne physics, which make her descend slower and have greater air control. As far as I know, it's actually just the sorty low gravity effect. Now, I want to get out of the way that I don't really like the altered air physics. They mess with my muscle memory and just feel kinda weird, but fortunately you can disable only that aspect of the passive with the Anchor Glide mod if you want to. The real star of the show, though, is that 150% increase in critical chance. This boost makes Zephyr's weapons much more powerful in exchange for doing virtually nothing differently, as Zephyr already wants to be airborne to better place her crowd control and such anyways. With her one suspending her in air and her lower gravity just making her linger in the air for longer, it's really easy to take advantage of this buff. This gels very well with Zephyr's most busted ability, Tornadoes, as critical hits are taken into account when boosting their damage. On top of that, crits that hit Tornadoes have their critical damage multiplied by two times, and this is considered after critical damage mods. This lets her get way more damage on her Tornadoes very easily, and also makes her very good at raining down high damage from above. All that said, this is our first S tier. Very good passive with a super easy activation condition that works well with her kit. Zephyr is honestly really broken, I'm very shocked I don't see her more. Hydroid Hydroid is an interesting one because I feel like his passive is conditionally very good, yet at other times it's pretty much worthless. How it works is that, whenever Hydroid damages an enemy, they get marked with a permanent debuff that makes them more vulnerable to the corrosive status effect. For ease of communication, I'll call this passive Wet, which surely has no atypical interpretations tied to it whatsoever. When an enemy is wet, the first stack of corrosive they receive removes 50% of their armor instead of the normal 26%, allowing a full 100% removal of armor at 10 stacks. This works very well with Hydroid's own kit, as nearly all of his abilities apply corrosive stacks, and even though armor isn't as oppressive as it used to be, the jump from 80% removal with normal corrosive to 100% with Hydroid is still considerable. Allies can also take advantage of this effect, as any corrosive stacks applied to a wet enemy will be more effective, not just those applied by Hydroid, and the effect is permanent. This passive boosting the first stack also means that enemies with status reduction, like Acolytes, will have more of their armor removed within their 4 proc limit. So that's all really good, but you might have already spotted the biggest issue here. If the enemy doesn't have any armor, this passive doesn't really do anything. When I brought this up on stream while making this tier list, many people argued that you should just not bring Hydroid to missions where unarmored targets are present, but I don't really think that's fair. There are plenty of legitimate reasons to play Hydroid in those environments, like farming with Pilfering Swarm for example, but even beyond that, Hydroid is just a fun character, and if you're feeling like playing him, I think having fun is as good a reason as any to bring him along, even if he doesn't excel in a certain environment. No faction exactly has zero armored units either, as the Corpus and Infested do have a few, but Hydroid really shines against the Grenier, Corrupted, Murmur, and Deimos Infested, while he lags behind against the Corpus and Regular Infested. As such, I'm putting his passive in A tier. It's very, very strong in environments where it works, but doesn't really do anything otherwise. As much of his kit also inflicts corrosive, this is a very strong point of synergy for him. Mirage Mirage's passive grants her two buffs. 85% longer slide duration, and 50% faster maneuvers. The 85% longer slide duration is honestly not really ever noticeable in my experience, so we're just going to kind of leave that at that. The maneuver speed increase is interesting though, as it boosts the speed of two things. Ledge mantles, and more importantly, rolls. These rolls go just as far as a normal roll, but are much faster, which lets Mirage get around very, very quickly. Especially because rolling preserves your momentum while certain other parkour movements like bullet jumping don't. This can be further boosted with other parkour velocity buffs to make Mirage absurdly fast when rolling, but even without any other buffs, it's still a very nice passive to have. It does technically reduce how long she has damage reduction for when she rolls, as rolling grants 75% DR for the duration of the animation, but I think the speed increase is more than worth it. In effect, she can cover 50% more ground in the same amount of time as other Warframes when using one of the most common movement options in the entire game. So I'm putting it in B tier. It isn't crazy or anything, but it's a very nice buff to have and makes Mirage much quicker in practice than much of the cast. Limbo Limbo's passive is a complex one, all tied to his unique rift mechanic. Basically, whenever Limbo rolls in any direction, he enters a parallel plane of existence called the Rift, while also leaving behind a portal that allies can use to follow. If he or his allies want to leave the Rift, all they need to do is just roll again, unless they're inside a Cataclysm bubble. While in the Rift, Limbo is immune to almost all damage from enemies outside of the Rift, though in exchange, he also can't damage those enemies that are outside the Rift unless he uses an ability. 
or the Zymos bees for some reason. Eximus abilities and a few other edge cases can target him through the rift, and nullifiers will just straight up rip him out of it, but otherwise he's really hard to hit. He can also just walk through laser barriers while in the rift, so do with that what you will. While in the rift, Limbo also generates a passive 2 energy per second, and any time an enemy dies while in the rift, Limbo is granted 10 energy, even if he wasn't the one who killed them. A lot of Limbo's abilities revolve around being in the Rift, namely Stasis and the Rift Torrent Augment, but even beyond that, it's incredibly good by itself. Limbo generates passive energy, gets bonus energy for kills on enemies in the Rift, and he can just walk through missions ignoring 90% of the enemies present. If you throw on Silence to shut down Eximus abilities, Limbo is genuinely almost untouchable. I know a lot of people hate Limbo and hate randomly being put in the Rift by him, and I absolutely relate to that but when examining his passive without the pain of being trolled by it, it's an easy S tier. Free energy and near invincibility just for rolling, which can be shared with teammates? Sign me the fuck up. Mesa Mesa's passive is interesting in that it actually has three effects. Mesa has 15% more fire rate with dual-wield pistols, 25% faster reload speed with single sidearms, and gains a flat 50 health when she has no melee equipped. The 50% increased fire rate applies to her regulators, which is nice, but much like Excalibur's passive, it isn't really that noticeable much at the time. The 25% faster reload speed with single sidearms is a decent boost, all things considered, especially because it also affects Incarnate Transformation speed, but it's also pretty reliant on what sidearm you're using, as it's more meaningful on some than others. The main issue with this buff, to me at least, is that Mesa is going to be in her regulators most of the time, so you won't really be reloading super often if you're frequently entering her for. It's by no means a bad buff per se, even if it is still not a huge boost numerically. It's just that I feel like Mesa doesn't get a ton out of it because she's an exalted weapon character. As for the flat 50 health with no melee, this one's honestly just stupid. When I say flat, I mean it doesn't scale with mods like Vitality or anything, it's just 50 HP added on top of what Mesa already has. Giving up something as valuable as your melee weapon for such a small buff is just asinine, especially when you consider that Mark of the Beast works on regulators, so using your glaive from time to time to power them up is a really useful tactic that this passive just locks you out of in exchange for a really underwhelming bonus. So, much like Excalibur, it's going down in D tier. It does do something, but not that much, and its best effect varies in usefulness depending on how you're playing Mesa. How would I improve it? Personally, i just boost all the numbers. Make it 50% more fire rate and reload speed, and make it apply to all secondaries instead of having any split between single or dual wield. As for the melee element, I'd just remove it. It's not helpful, and I don't think any HP bonus would offset the cost of losing your melee. I also do want to bring up Nova Umbral's idea, which was to grant Mesa some kind of critical chance and or damage buff considering she utilizes crits so heavily. This could be entirely passive, or maybe could even have an activation condition, like stacking when she shoots an enemy or something like that. Chroma For Chroma, I want to make it clear I'm not counting his ability to pick his element with his emissive color. That used to be his sole passive, yes, but now that he can swap in mission with his one, I don't really think it's sensible to count it. Considering the fact that he can just swap elements in mission now, it's only really relevant if you're using a helmet over Spectral Scream. So what's left then? Well, Chroma gets access to either a second bullet jump or double jump, which sprouts his wings for a really cool visual effect. Beyond that cool visual though, I don't really find this passive to be all that helpful. It certainly can be useful, especially if used in conjunction with parkour velocity shards or infested mobility, but by itself it isn't really anything to write home about. The wings are cool as fuck though, I'd love to have this as an auxiliary or an ephemera of some kind. The passive also doesn't really mesh with any of Chroma's kit, as he doesn't exactly have any ability that benefits from the additional jump. It's definitely more of a thematic passive than a functional one. It fits Chroma's theme as a dragon more than it fits into how his kit actually functions. Even so, it does enable some niche but fun speed strategies, especially if used in conjunction with parkour velocity boosts, so I'm putting it in C tier. I originally had this one in D tier, but I feel like in comparison to all the other D tiers, you can actually get something out of it with a bit of work, so I decided to bump it up. Alright, short and sweet. Next up, Equinox. Equinox's passive grants her a whopping 10% equilibrium effect, meaning that whenever she picks up a health orb, she gets 10% of its health value as energy, and if she picks up an energy orb, she gets 10% of its energy value as health. Not only is this bonus really low, often equating to 5 or 10 energy or health at most, but unlike almost every other effect that consumes orbs, Equinox's passive can't pick up an orb if she's already full on that resource. So if she's full on health but not energy, she can't pick up health orbs to gain energy, which can be done with things like Equilibrium or Violet Shards. 
If I'm honest though, this might actually be to her benefit, as the bonus is so low that it's honestly a waste of potential health or energy she could have gotten in the future if she was able to pick them up like with Equilibrium. None of her abilities also really help her spawn orbs, so this effect doesn't really have any built-in synergy with her kit. Though orbs are common enough, it doesn't necessarily need to. I'm putting this passive straight in F tier. Technically does something, sure, but that something is so small and insignificant it genuinely just doesn't matter. My improvement to it is simple. Make the bonus 50% and let it pick up orbs even if the matching resource is full. This would be really helpful for managing Equinox's rough energy economy, which would make the passive do something more for her kit, while also making the effect actually noticeable. Equinox has it rough, man. I really hope DE gives this frame some help. Atlas. Atlas is another character with multiple passives, though this time he has a simple one and a complicated one, so we'll start with the simple one. This passive is called Immovable, which makes Atlas immune to knockdown and self-stagger effects so long as he's touching the ground. This allows him to take advantage of AoE weapons and the like without staggering himself, and is also just a huge quality of life increase. This does have its drawbacks though, namely that Atlas can still be knocked down while in the air, and as bullet jumping is a very common movement tactic, it can lead to him getting jump scared by a laser barrier or something and falling over. This is especially noteworthy when you consider that Atlas has a pretty low sprint speed, so he relies on things like bullet jumps more than most. Atlas's landslide ability also makes him immune to knockdowns anyway, so if you're playing around it then you won't have many opportunities for enemies to knock you down outside of that state regardless. Okay, that's the easy one. Now on to the complicated one, Rubble. Rubble is a pickup unique to Atlas that drops from enemies who die while petrified, either by Atlas's own abilities or the Gorgon's metamorphic magazine augment. Rumblers also drop Rubble on death, though the lower their health was at the time of their death, the lower the bonus the Rubble grants. These Rubble drops grant Atlas 50 health, or if his health is full, 50 armor that goes into this armor gauge. If the enemy died to landslide specifically while petrified, it goes up to 75 health or armor, with the armor gauge stacking all the way up to 1500 armor in total. Armor decays at a rate of 5 per second from the gauge, doubled to 10 per second if in a nullifier bubble, but picking up rubble pauses this decay for 2 seconds so long as that pickup restored armor. I want to make it clear that if Atlas is missing any health, then rubble pickups will heal him and overhealing will not go into the armor pool, so the decay timer will not stop. This often creates really annoying scenarios where you just keep getting chipped and losing a little bit of health, which makes your rubble pickups grant HP instead of armor, ultimately leading to your armor bonus going away. On the bright side, it doesn't go away if you fall off the map, and rubble drops can be pulled in by vacuum and fetch, but I do think the lack of any decay rate pause when the rubble restores health is a huge pain regardless. It also takes quite a bit of effort to build up that 1500 armor, so environments where Atlas isn't able to get a lot of kills, he can't really take that much advantage of it. 1500 armor is a 5 times effective health multiplier, which helps make Atlas quite a bit tankier, but funnily enough, you don't really want to be taking health damage because then your armor decay won't pause. In a weird sort of paradox, you're given all this armor that you don't want to actually take advantage of because then you'll start to lose that armor. Now, if we're counting augments, Rubble Heat makes this passive excellent, but as I'm not going to be considering them, this passive's gonna go into B tier. It's a solid effect, so much so that I honestly think it's almost A, but the sort of paradoxical nature of the armor buff just kinda makes it a headache which keeps me from putting it any higher. Wukong Wukong is weird because he doesn't really have a passive ability necessarily, instead getting one of five random buffs whenever he dies. Basically, if Wukong takes fatal damage, he becomes invincible and restores 50% of his health, and then one of five buffs is chosen at random. The buffs Wukong can get are as follows. Cosmic Armor, where Wukong is invincible for 30 seconds. Primal Forces, which grants Wukong 300% more elemental damage for 60 seconds. Heavenly Cloak, which makes Wukong invisible for 30 seconds, and this isn't dispelled by attacks. Sly Alchemy, which makes orb pickups four times more effective for 60 seconds. And finally, Monkey Luck, which makes enemies drop extra loot for 60 seconds. Monkey Luck does not stack with other loot on death abilities like Pilfering Swarm, Strangle Dome, or another Wukong's Monkey Luck, but it can stack with other sources of additional loot like Ivara's Stealing, Necro Sanchez's Corpse Looting, and Atlas's Ore Gaze. These buffs can be triggered up to three times per mission, with the three buffs being pre-selected at the start and then one being chosen at random from that pool. This passive does have its value, namely that it skips bleedout entirely which makes it very good for arbitrations as that mode screws over self-revives that enter the bleedout state. Regardless of that though, I really, really don't like passives that are entirely contingent on the player dying. I think that passives with activation conditions aren't necessarily a bad thing, but whenever that activation condition is dying, the main thing the player is trying to avoid, I think it's a problem. If you're playing well, then you basically never benefit from this passive, which means you basically don't have any passive. 
The buffs themselves are also pretty short-lived. You can't strategize around them because they're random, and Wukong has enough survivability that dying on him in the first place is relatively easy to avoid. Beyond all that though, this passive ceases to exist after the third activation, meaning you have no passive if you die more than three times. All that considered, I'm putting this in C tier. It has its benefits, and is certainly not bad enough to be any lower, but I think that purely on-death passives are counterintuitive, and I'd like to see some additional component added to it. Still, the buffs you get are good while they're active, and the extra safety net is nichely useful, so C tier is where it gets to live. Ivara Ivara's passive grants her 50 meters of built-in enemy radar, instead of the usual 30 meters, letting her see enemies considerably farther out. Prior to the addition of Universal Enemy Radar, this was honestly a fantastic passive, but I think it's not nearly as useful now that everyone gets that built-in 30 meters. It does play well into Ivara's theme and kit, allowing her to pre-plan her stealth with more information and find far-out targets for navigator shots, even if she can't see them. Even so, the extra 20 meters rarely makes that much of an impact in my own experience, especially because Ivara often wants to be close to enemies to pickpocket them or land multiple shots with Artemis Bow. It does have some uses for sure, namely that it shows enemy direction, but if you're using Animal Instinct, it does that too, and lots of people generally are. I honestly don't think that this passive is impactful enough to matter for most of Avara's gameplay, unfortunately. I'm going to begrudgingly put it in D tier, as much as I think it is almost in C, because I just can't think of a use case where it'd be good enough to compete with the other stuff going into C tier. How would I change it? Honestly, I think it'd be cool if Ivara had some kind of escalating buff the longer she remained undetected. Maybe just to play into her stealth theme, but that's just an idea off the top of my head. Maybe the longer she's in stealth, the more damage she gets? Something like that. I am just throwing out ideas for fun here, okay? Don't expect them to be good. Neja. Neja's passive lets him slide 60% faster and 35% farther, stacking with mobility mods that affect slides like Streamlined Form. This passive allows Nezha to be very fast when sliding, and when combined with his Firewalker ability, it lets him spread fire around very quickly. I personally really like this passive, but the main issue with it is that some people will find it really annoying. I think this one comes down to how you play the frame. When I play Nezha, it's partially for the slide passive, but some people don't like it and either tolerate it so they can access the rest of his kit, or they just use Controlled Slide to turn it off entirely. I feel that it probably belongs in C tier, on the grounds that it can be used to enable certain strategies, but is admittedly somewhat preference-based. I think this one has a genuine shot at B tier, or even higher, but that entirely depends on who's playing Neja and how they use his kit. This one's not too complicated, so let's move on to Inaros. Inaros is another character with two passive components, so I'll go over the easy one first. Whenever Inaros kills an enemy with a melee finisher or a mercy kill, he restores 20% of his max health. This is a decent passive, especially because Anaros has several abilities that open enemies up to finishers, but if the attack itself doesn't kill or the enemy dies to something else during the finisher animation, it doesn't really do much. More importantly though, is Anaros can heal very easily with Sandstorm already, and it's not hard to get energy for that ability by using Rage, so while this passive is by no means unwelcome, it also isn't crazy useful or anything. The other component of this passive is, like Wukong, an on-death effect. Whenever Inaros dies, he enters his sarcophagus and becomes a Sand Shadow. This shadow has to hit enemies with melee attacks, which uses a special fist-type weapon to revive Inaros. Fortunately, this doesn't require kills, just hits, and Sand Kitties from Scarab Swarm will also contribute to the revive meter. This isn't terrible by any means, especially because it's able to actually revive Inaros pretty quickly, but I still just don't like on-death passives. This is especially so for Anaros, who has enough armor and health that he's quite difficult to kill in most content anyways, meaning that, again, if you're playing well, you won't be seeing this passive much at all. His lack of shield gate does make it more relevant than something like Wukong's passive, but he's still tanky enough to not be insta-killed in most environments. Fortunately, unlike Wukong, Anaros has a functional passive component outside of his self-revive, but it's honestly not super useful in my opinion because he can already heal so easily. Unfortunately, unlike Wukong, this passive straight up doesn't work in arbitrations, and Aros will just die. As such, I'm gonna put this in C tier. It has a worse on death effect than Wukong, but I do think that the finisher heal helps bolster finisher focused builds. It does play well with Anaros' kit from the finisher angle, but his easy access to healing just kind of makes it less valuable in my view. Titania Titania's passive grants her the Upsurge buff, which triggers when she casts any ability and grants her 4 health regen per second for 20 seconds. This effect also applies to allies within 15 meters of her, and whenever an ability is cast while the buff is active, it resets back to its full 20 second duration. Titania also possesses 25% further bullet jumps and rolls, which is nice. So, to break down my feelings about this passive, I want to start with that increased roll distance. It's definitely helpful, 
but my issue with it is that Titania is often going to be in her Razor Wing, which doesn't really need the increased parkour distance. Beyond that though, the 4 HP per second from Upsurge is just really weak. That's a total of 80 health over 20 seconds, and because the timer resets to the start whenever you cast an ability while it's active, you essentially waste any remaining time that would have healed you. To Upsurge's benefit though, it doesn't need to be a crazy high heal because Titania gets high evasion from both Razor Wing and Dust, and she gets a 50% damage reduction from Thorns, so she isn't taking damage all that often. Because of that, when she actually does take damage, it's usually not a crazy amount, and the time between damage instances is so long that she normally doesn't need to worry too much about it. Even so, items like Magus Elevate and Repair make recovering from small amounts of damage so quick and easy that they often overshadow the passive quite a bit, and Titania is still evasive enough, she often isn't taking any damage past what might graze her shields. As such, this one's going in C tier. It's a helpful buff, especially because it's shared with allies, but it's also a really small heal spread out over a pretty long time. The bullet jump and roll distance is fun and enables some niche strategies with our core boosts, much like Chroma's passive, so I gotta give her points for that, even if it makes little impact while she's in Razor Wing. I feel like this kind of toes the D tier line if I'm honest, but I don't think it's quite that bad. Though I would like to see the health regen buff to like 10 per second or something. Okay, I just want to let you all know that we're at the halfway point for this video, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because I'm actually recording this on a different day than the first half of this video, because after like an hour and a half of talking my voice got too tired, so I'm probably going to sound a bit different, my apologies for that. Quality control with this microphone is a huge pain in the ass. Anyways, let's move on to Nidus. Nidus is another character with a very multifaceted passive, so we'll go over it from simple to complicated like we have before. So for the simple stuff, because Nidus doesn't have any shields to gain on rank up bonuses, he instead gains a passive 15 health regen per second and 15% power strength at rank 30. Inaros has these to compensate for his lack of shields too, but they're only health and energy maximum, which aren't as impactful in my opinion. So, Nidus has a heal that's better than Titania's passive just for being at rank 30, even if it is only for himself. So, the more complicated component of this passive is Nidus' mutation stacks, which he gains every time an ability of Nidus' hits an enemy. This counts primarily the number of hits from his first ability, though maggots from Ravenous exploding also contribute to the gauge, and enemies who die while held by Larva have a 50% chance to add to it as well. Each time 5 contributions are made to the gauge, it goes up one level, stopping at level 100 normally, or 300 with the abundant mutation augment. I know, I know, we aren't counting augments, I'm just bringing it up to be thorough. So, what's the benefit of having mutation stacks? Well, for starters, Nidus' third and fourth abilities consume them instead of energy, which is more of a footnote than anything, honestly, I kinda feel like that's cheating. A big thing for him, though, is that Maggot Explosions and Virulence both gain increased damage, which helps bolster his gameplay loop of grouping up enemies with his two and then killing them with his one. In a funny way, he actually reminds me a lot of playing Plague Inc. You chip away at enemies until you've built up the mutation stacks to actually reliably kill them. This passive has one more important component though. If Nidus takes fatal damage, he consumes 15 mutation stacks to save himself via an effect called Undying. This makes Nidus invincible for 5 seconds and restores 50% of his maximum health. The reason I think this passive component is much better than other death passives, aside from the fact that he has a passive outside of it, is twofold. For starters, it skips bleed out entirely, meaning that Nidus has no downtime and stays in the fight uninterrupted, which allows it to be used in arbitrations. The other reason I like it is because it's relatively easy to build up and isn't lost if it's used too many times like Wukong's is. Sure, you do have to get those 15 mutation stacks back, but if you lose them by triggering the passive, it isn't terribly difficult. On top of that, if you're at full mutation stacks, you can trigger this passive 6 consecutive times before you actually die, and if you manage to gain 5 more mutation stacks during those deaths, you can die 7 times. Considering that Nidus has no shield gate on account of being a health only frame, this is an incredibly valuable passive for him to have, as while he is pretty tanky, he's nowhere near Inaros' level, which makes having some form of a death gate more useful for him. Now, there is one major drawback to this passive. It takes a lot of effort to build all the way up, so in missions that aren't endless it's not going to be nearly as effective and triggering Undying carries a much heavier price. I know I said it's not that hard to get back earlier, and I do think that's completely true, specifically if you're in an endless environment. For things like exterminate, mobile defense, anything like that, you're going to be a lot more starved for your mutation stacks. All that considered, I'm slotting this one in A tier. Passive HP regen and power strength, a huge boost in damage to his maggots and virulence, and the ability to die with virtually no downtime. This passive drives Nidus' kit and is exceptionally good for him specifically, and that strong synergy combined with its sizable raw power makes it very high up there for me. 
This one is almost S, but the effort it takes to build up in many game modes is what keeps it from going quite that high, and it can be very punishing if you trigger Undying multiple times in a very short window. Octavia I'm gonna be honest, I think this passive is overrated as hell, but I'll make the case for it regardless. I do want to clarify up front, I'm not going to be considering the Mandacore to be Octavia's passive. It's a fun mechanic, sure, but I feel like how you set up your song is more of a preference than anything. That's why mine is just the Among Us strip theme. Instead I'm going to focus on Inspiration, which is a buff that's very similar to Titania's Upsurge. Whenever Octavia casts an ability, she grants nearby allies the Inspiration buff, which grants them 1 energy per second for 30 seconds. Just like Upsurge, if an ability is cast while Inspiration is active, it will reset that duration back to 30 seconds, effectively wasting energy you would have earned if you let the buff play out. Considering how easy it is to get energy these days, I feel like 1 per second for a total of 30 over 30 seconds just isn't really that good, especially because you can partially waste it by casting things before the timer ends. Octavia is usually casting several abilities in quick succession, so she's often doing that very thing, meaning you're throwing away a lot of potential energy. I don't know, people pushed very hard for this one to be higher up when I made this on stream, but I still just don't get it. Energy Nexus is 3 per second, Wellspring is 5 per second, hell a Styanax Spectre is more effective than this. Even so, I do still think that the energy buff is more useful than Titania's Upsurge buff, so despite finding this passive mid as hell, I'm putting it in B tier. This one toes the line between B and C for me, but I think it's just barely not mediocre enough to be C, especially because it's shared with teammates who may need the buff more than you do. Even so, I think it's almost down there. It depends on the day. Harrow Harrow has two pretty simple passive effects. He starts the mission with full energy, and his overshield capacity is doubled up to 2400 overshields. The built-in preparation is more of a convenience thing than anything, especially because Harrow can generate energy so easily, but it's definitely very nice to have. Kind of in the same vein, the doubled overshield capacity is nice both for survivability and fueling the duration of penance. I think that both of these buffs are solid in their own right and work well with Harrow's kit, but I don't find either of them to be insanely helpful. Harrow's easy energy generation makes the preparation only really matter for about 10 seconds, and the overshield capacity, while nice, does melt pretty fast at higher level. Because Harrow can restore his shield so easily with Condemn, and he has very few energy concerns because of Thurible, he doesn't need the overshields to be so high because he can just get them back with very little effort. Even so, it plays well within Harrow's kit and both buffs are absolutely good, so I'm putting it in B tier. Buffs are solid, but nothing crazy in my opinion. Again, if this list was ordered, it would probably be around high B, and I think it makes a solid argument for A, but I just don't think it's quite that good. Gara. Gara's passive grants her a 15% chance whenever she casts an ability to blind enemies within 12 meters for 10 seconds. Each time the blind doesn't trigger though, the chance of this happening goes up by 20% until it finally does trigger, where it then falls back down to the base of 15%. Blinded enemies are open to finishers much like Radial Blind, and interestingly enough, this works through both Nullifier Bubbles and Overguard. This passive is pretty solid all things considered, adding an extra layer of survivability to Gara by preventing enemies from attacking her. Does she really need it that much? That's debatable considering she has Splinter Storm and Mass Vitrify, but it's definitely not unhelpful, especially with it working through things that normally block CC. In my view, the biggest drawback of this passive is that it's somewhat random. Sure, you do have some bad luck protection with the chance increasing each time you cast an ability, but you can't really strategize around it so much as just spam abilities in hopes that it triggers. Gara also doesn't really have anything in her kit that encourages the use of finishers, so it's another example of a passive that's more thematic than functional, though its actual effect is still very useful. On account of its randomness and lack of kit relevance, I'm putting it in B tier. Helpful effect, absolutely, it's basically a free radial blind every now and again, it's just a bit inconsistent and doesn't really play into Gara's kit all that much. Korra Korra's passive revolves around her exalted cat Venari, who is a pretty complex little demon. As long as Venari is alive, she grants Korra a 15% speed boost, and if she dies, she respawns after 45 seconds, though she can be brought back instantly if Korra uses her third ability in exchange for an energy cost. Weirdly enough, this speed boost passive is actually affected by power strength, and considering that it's pretty common to use low strength on Korra because of accumulating Whip Claw, this part of Venari is pretty much non-existent. I'm not going to be covering Venari's different stances in depth as those are tied to Korra's third ability and I consider them the function of that ability, except for attack form which Venari is in by default. If I'm honest, the healing form is probably the best of them in my opinion. The defensive form just sucks, and the attack form, while not super strong, is still pretty good single target crowd control. 
Beyond that though, Venari can be modded like any other companion, which allows for a lot of interesting stuff. For instance, she can use Animal Instinct in addition to Korra's other companion, and the two will actually stack for huge amounts of loot radar. She can also be used to equip bond mods like Tandem Bond, Tenacious Bond, or Vicious Bond to take advantage of their synergies. Funnily enough, this is what really makes Venari valuable. Most of her unique companion elements aren't that great, but her ability to be a platform for companion mods, especially ones that can stack with your other companion, is very valuable. Hey, editing cool kid here. Something I somehow forgot to mention in the original script read is that several of these bond mods, such as Tenacious and Tandem Bond, can also be stacked across Venari and Korra's other companion for double the effect, which is very powerful. And just like with Mag's passive, having fetch on Venari is worthless if your other companion has it on already. Venari also has some interesting mechanics of her own. Her health is so high that she can actually benefit more from enhanced fatality than Link health. She also has no shields, but she can get them if Link's shields is equipped. She also doesn't enter bleed out, meaning she can't be revived, which does kinda suck. Fortunately, her health and armor are abnormally high, so she is tankier than many other companions. Now, I'll admit, I really wish DE would rework Venari, especially because she's supposed to be Korra's main gimmick and get her different forms or an easy subsume slot, but I won't deny that the addition of the Bond mods was a huge buff to her. That considered, she's going in B tier, able to provide quite a few beneficial effects that can often stack with Korra's normal companion, which is quite effective, and mods like Tandem and Tenacious Bond synergize with Korra's playstyle really well. I think this passive could be argued into A tier from a power perspective, but for me, the lack of originality in Venari is what makes me put it in B. She's strong, sure, but only because she's a platform for things that are already strong, not because she's really that special or unique on her own. Umbra. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Didn't you already cover Excalibur? And that's true, I did, but Umbra's passive is a little different. He has the same 10% damage and speed increase as Excalibur, but he also has a unique passive called Umbral Sentience, where whenever the player enters their operator, he fights as an autonomous specter. This passive sounds pretty cool, and I'll admit you can have some fun with it, but it has several severe issues. Most notable of them is that Excalibur dispels any channeled abilities he has active when you enter your operator, with the exception of Exalted Blade. This means that the basic function of entering your operator can actively screw you over, which is very rough because there are a lot of reasons you might want to enter your operator. Umbra will also draw aggro and get fired at, meaning that healing him with stuff like Magus Repair or Elevate can be difficult because he wanders off and keeps taking damage. It can be used for some funny strategies, but I doubt anyone really wants to stay in their operator and let the frame play the game for them. I know some people are going to disagree with this, but I'm putting Umbral Sentience in F tier. This passive has some strategies you can do with it, but the drawbacks tied to it make it a detriment more than anything. It's really cool from a lore standpoint, and I absolutely adore Umbra as a concept and a character, but in practice this is less of a passive and more of an active shooting yourself straight in the foot. I honestly think that the best thing you can do for Umbra is put on Warrior's Rest and just turn this shit off, because he's far more usable that way. Revenant Revenant's passive causes him to emit a radial attack over 7.5 meters whenever his shields are broken, dealing 100 blast damage. I... I don't feel like I have to explain why this is bad, but I'm going to anyways. Why are your shields breaking? Your Revenant. Your 2 makes you invincible. If you even trigger this passive, something has gone seriously wrong. Even if your shields did break, 100 damage in a 7.5 meter radius is an absolute joke. Easy F tier, doesn't make any sense on Revenant, and is super weak even regardless of that. How would I improve it? I honestly don't really know considering that Revenant doesn't need any improvements, but my suggestion is to make it tie into his Thrall mechanic. Maybe he could get a buff whenever he kills a Thrall, or get some kind of buff while having Thralls like with his Augment, but that's debatably not really a passive. I don't know dude, I just want people to use the rest of Revenant's kit and not just Mesmer skin. He's really cool conceptually, but the rest of his gameplay loop is just completely overshadowed by his too. Garuda Garuda's passive is honestly nuts, and I'm going to explain why. So, whenever Garuda gets a kill or assist, she gains a 5% damage bonus, and this stacks up to 100% more damage. If she hasn't gotten a kill in 5 seconds, this bonus starts to decay by 1% every 2 seconds. If she's in a nullifier field, however, the bonus decays after 1 second at a rate of 2% every second. Okay, side note, this kind of shit happens with Nidus too, and does anyone else find it complete nonsense that a nullifier can also drain your passive? Anyways, so, 100% more damage, which applies to both her weapons and abilities. That's already really good, but there's another layer that makes it completely broken. 
You remember in the Voban section where we talked about the difference between additive and multiplicative bonuses? Well, Garuda's damage bonus is a multiplicative one, and like Voban's, it multiplies with other sources of multiplicative damage, like Roar and Faction mods. This means she's basically getting Voban's passive, but four times more effective, and she builds it by killing things. Which is, you know, the game. She also gets progress for assists, so if she, say, uses her four on a group of enemies and then her teammates kill them all, she'll still gain progress towards her passive. Combining this passive bonus with things like Roar or Status Damage mods gets Garuda some huge damage boosts, and it's still extremely good by itself regardless. I also do want to passingly mention Garuda's Talons. Or Garuda Talons? What the fuck? Anyways, this is a weapon unique to Garuda which can be accessed if she has no melee equipped. The stats on her regular Talons are solid, but the Prime Talons are genuinely insanely good. High Slash Weighting at 85%, 35% critical chance, 36% status chance, and unlike typical exalted weapons, the Talons can use mods like Blood Rush, Weeping Wounds, and Amalgam Organ Shatter. It doesn't increase in damage with power strength, which kinda sucks, but it's honestly so powerful statistically that I don't even think that matters. One last thing, Garuda gets 125% more energy at rank 30 instead of the normal 50%, so she has the highest energy pool in the entire game. As you can see, there's a lot going for this Warframe in the passive department, which makes her the easiest S tier of this entire video. Multiplicative damage that multiplies with other multiplicative sources that you earn just for playing the game, on top of a huge energy pool and an incredibly good melee? Not a hard choice. I honestly considered making an S plus tier specifically for this passive, it is that good. Baruch. Baruch's passive grants him a unique resource called Restraint, which weirdly enough starts as a full meter and grants benefits for removing it. Restraint is removed by Baruch's first three abilities, and to explain how specifically. Dodging an attack with Elude removes 1.2% from the meter, every enemy put to sleep with Lull removes 0.8%, and disarming an enemy with Desolate Hands removes 1.6%. The lower the Restraint meter is, the more damage reduction Baruch gets, up to 50% when it's completely empty. Baruch's fourth ability, Serene Storm, restores Restraint instead of using energy, meaning that Baruch trades that damage reduction to access his very powerful Exalted weapon, though he can still reduce his Restraint using the above methods while his Exalted is active. I'm not going to focus on the ultimate being tied to the passive that much, as I feel like that's more giving credit to the ability, but it is noteworthy that this meter is what grants Baruch access to it. On top of that, it creates this interesting dynamic of using energy and using the meter separately, so Baruch kind of has to juggle two resources. The 50% damage reduction is pretty nice all things considered, but I think it shines on Baruch because he has several other sources of damage reduction, namely up to 90% from Desolate Hands and 40% while Desert Wind is equipped. Because of all this damage reduction, Baruch becomes quite difficult to kill up to fairly high levels, which when combined with his crowd control makes him quite tanky. So I'm going to put this passive in B tier, an easy to access damage reduction that stacks with Baruch's other sources of damage reduction on top of allowing him access to Desert Wind which is very strong. The only thing keeping it from going any higher for me is that Baruch is incentivized to regain restraint by using Serene Storm, and he still has so many other sources of damage reduction that it's definitely not required. Still, it's a useful effect he gets just for using his abilities. Hildren. Hildren has a pretty complex passive, so this is going to be a bit tricky. Fundamentally, Hildren has no energy, and instead uses her enormous shield capacity to use her abilities. Because of this lack of energy, she gains an additional 500 shields and 100 health from her rank up bonuses. Mods that affect efficiency instead reduce the amount of shields consumed, and energy orbs grant her 25 shields while also immediately resetting her shield recharge delay. Beyond that, Hildren has the longest shield gate in the entire game at 3.5 seconds, and overshields block damage that would normally go directly to her health, like toxin procs or combat discipline. This passive in isolation is already pretty solid, but it's made even better by the fact that Hildren's Pillage grants her ludicrous amounts of shields and overshields at the press of a button, meaning that she's both very hard to kill and has near limitless energy. This lets her spam her own abilities very often, and beyond that, she can also spam the hell out of Helminth abilities because they're also made to consume her shields. Overshields blocking toxin damage also effectively removes her biggest weakness so long as you have overshields. Basically, this passive makes her much more survivable because of her colossal shield pool and lengthy shield gate on top of having the overshield defense layer, and it lets her spam her own abilities or any helmet ability she has on. The one major knock I'm going to give this passive is that the only abilities Hildred herself can really spam are Pillage and Balefire, and while Haven is helpful in a team, I find Aegisstorm to just not be very useful. All that said, I'm putting this passive in A tier. It's very very good, but I don't think it gets quite into broken territory. 
Still, it's a strong part of Hildren's identity and incredibly interesting and useful. Honestly, I think this is another passive you could make a good argument for S tier. Wisp. Wisp's passive makes her and her companions invisible while she's airborne, and this lasts indefinitely so long as she stays in the air. There's about a one second delay when touching the ground before the cloak goes away, so as long as she stays jumping, she'll be cloaked pretty much forever. Weapon fire will break the cloak, though it will come back after a delay if Wisp is still airborne, but melee attacks do not break the stealth. This passive is very, very good, allowing Wisp to just jump her way through missions without ever being attacked and keeping her companions safe in the process. Because melees don't break the stealth, she can also spam things like glaives freely without ever becoming visible, which is also very useful. Wisp may have many other ways to stay alive, like her health moat, invisibility from her too, and invincibility when teleporting to her too, but this lets her be basically immortal just for being airborne. She can also use this in conjunction with certain helminth abilities to not break the stealth while spam casting them as well, which makes her a very effective frame for staying alive and using her energy pool to just focus on those helminth abilities. This one's also a relatively easy S tier for me. Easy access to one of the game's best survivability tools for almost no cost. This could be argued into A tier on account of Wisp's other defensive options, but for me, it's an S. Gauss. Gauss's passive grants him the unique Kinetic Battery, which he builds up in several ways. Moving, reviving an ally, using Mock Rush, or casting Thermal Sunder's Cold Zone. This passive is amplified whenever Gauss is using his Redline ability, but as those functions are behind that ability, I'm not going to be considering them. Still, this passive is very strong and has several important kit synergies. First and foremost, the higher Gauss's battery, the lower his shield regen delay and the faster his shield recharge rate. This caps out at 80% less delay and 120% faster recharge speed at full battery, which makes Gauss's shields come back very, very quickly, allowing him to abuse his shield gate with relative ease. Kinetic plating's damage reduction also increases the higher the battery, making Gauss immune to physical, heat, cold, and blast damage entirely when the battery is full, but 0.1% of the battery is lost with each hit this plating takes. This doesn't sound like a lot, but trust me, that adds up pretty fast. If you're using Redline, you can lock the battery to 100%, meaning you don't lose any battery for taking damage or using Heat Sunder, which also removes battery normally. I think it's important to mention, but again, as these are locked behind Redline, I don't count them as part of the passive. The battery also increases the damage of both Thermal Sunder elements, up to five times their normal damage if at full battery. So, all the benefits considered, I'm putting Gauss in A tier. Once again, if this was ordered, it would be a very high A tier, but it's not, so just A tier. His passive is easily S when you have Redline active, as it augments all of his other abilities and lets the battery stay at full charge until the ability ends, but I feel like it's just not fair to count that. So for his easy shield regen and boost to his 2 and 3, Gauss will live in A tier, though he's functionally just one button press away from being an instant S. Grendel Grendel's passive grants him a flat 250 armor for every enemy he has in his stomach, up to 1,250 at 5 enemies. This is kind of a weird passive as you have to use an ability to access it, but considering that all of Grendel's other abilities rely on the stomach mechanic, I do think it fits. This passive is an okay buff all things considered, but my biggest problem with it is that Grendel consumes the things in his stomach to cast his abilities, so generally you're not keeping them in there for very long. This kind of just gives Grendel a reward if he forgets to cast his abilities, and while 1250 armor isn't terrible, it's not amazing either. His large health pool makes this armor more valuable for sure, but his low shield capacity also makes him great for shield gating if used with catalyzing shields, so this armor can all but be ignored if that strategy is being employed. All that considered, I'm putting this one in C tier. It can be nichely helpful if you're relying on your health, but Grendel's constant spitting of enemies and exceptional ability to use catalyzing shields makes this passive pretty ignorable. I know this one being in C tier means I don't really need to suggest an improvement, but I think it'd be really nice if the armor buff lingered for like 10 seconds or something whenever Grendel spit out an enemy, and that it would gain a stack every time he's eaten an enemy up to 5, with each new stack refreshing all the stack durations. I think this would make it less counterintuitive and play more into how you actually play Grendel, but that's just my opinion. Protea Fortunately, this passive is pretty simple. Whenever Protea casts an ability, she adds one bar to a unique meter, and after she's added three bars, the fourth ability that she casts will be granted 100% more power strength additive with power strength mods. Using this power strength bonus resets the meter back to zero bars, requiring it to again be filled up by using abilities. This passive is both really good numerically and also really interesting as it adds a layer of depth to Protea's gameplay. 
All of Protea's abilities benefit from power strength, so she has to decide what order she wants to cast them in in order to maximize one particular ability. To make it clear, power strength effects, grenade fan shrapnel damage and shield regeneration rate, blaze artillery's damage, dispensary's chance to drop an extra item, and temporal anchor's damage conversion. This is especially interesting when adding Protea's Temporal Erosion and Artillery Augments into the mix, as Protea can choose to use this bonus to either increase the Armor Strip of Temporal Erosion, or boost the damage of Temporal Artillery as it caps out at a 20 times damage multiplier. This bonus also applies to any abilities subsumed on via the Helminth, which opens up a world of interesting choices. For example, you can use it to empower Roar, which boosts the damage of Blaze Artillery and double dips on its heat procs. This is just one example, but I'm sure you get the idea. The addition of the Helminth puts a lot of interesting options on the table. Due to its versatility, interesting player choice, and just raw strength, I'm putting Protea in S tier. This passive both makes her much stronger and adds a layer of using your brain that I very much enjoy. Zaku Zaku's passive grants them 25% reduced damage from AoE attacks and a 25% for any attack that would have hit them to simply pass through them. This passive is kinda tricky to me, because it goes up to 75% while the Vast on Time is active, and when playing Zaku, that'll pretty much always be the case. Thing is, I've already established that if passives get better when you use a certain ability, I think it's only fair to count the passive without that ability, and that leaves this one in a pretty bad spot. The 25% DR and dodge chance aren't honestly that helpful because they're such low numbers, and because the dodge is a mechanic separate from evasion, the two can't stack. I know a lot of people will be upset with me for this, but I'm going to put this passive in D tier on account of it being so weak by itself. However, when the Vast on Time is active, that 75% dodge chance in Explosion DR is quite helpful, and I'd put that somewhere in like B tier. Because I consider that a function of the ability though, it's going to live in D tier on this list, but know that in practice it is typically much better. How would I improvement? Honestly, I don't really know. I feel like it works fine while the Vast on Time is active, and that's pretty much always, so while the criteria of this list put it low, I actually think it's fine in practice so long as it's enhanced by Zaku's 4. Lavos Lavos has a lot going on, so I'm going to do my best to break it down. Most obviously, Lavos has no energy pool, instead having cooldowns on his abilities. Because of this, energy efficiency mods instead increase the cooldown reduction granted by Transmutation Probe and the Swift Bite Augment. These cooldowns also apply to Helminth abilities, being 10 seconds between casts, and channeled abilities like Gloom will be given a duration of 12 seconds at base. Beyond the cooldowns, Lavos' abilities can also imbue his next cast with elemental damage by holding down one of his abilities. Ophidian Bite grants Toxin, Vial Rush grants Cold, Transmutation Probe grants Electric, and Catalyze grants Heat. Lavos can also combine these primary elements into secondary elements, and they'll then be added to the next ability he casts, which then consumes the queued up element so he can imbue a new one. DOT effects will have one stack applied, while non-DOT effects will have three stacks. This is a straight boost in both damage and utility, so there's pretty much no reason for Lavos to ever not imbue an ability, as even if you only want to deal one damage type, imbuing it still doubles the damage and proc count. It is important to note though that subsumed abilities do not benefit from this bonus elemental damage, and if you remove an ability via the Helminth, you also lose access to its corresponding element. I honestly considered not counting this elemental imbuement because it only does something if you cast an ability, but because it's listed in-game as his passive, I felt like I should include it based on definitions. Much like Hildren, Lavos also has a unique interaction with energy orbs or universal orbs created by his three, which grants him 10 seconds of status immunity. This means that Lavos can't be knocked down, self-staggered, or afflicted with any negative status effects. The pickup of an energy or universal orb has an internal cooldown of 5 seconds, but if Lavos is missing any health, or is using a mod like Synth Fiber, he can pick up universal orbs to bypass the cooldown. Lavos also has one more unique mechanic tied to his ability duration stat, which boosts all status duration by the same amount as his ability duration. I know I said earlier when I talked about Ash and Saren that I didn't find the status duration that impactful, but I want to clarify I mostly think that in regard to damage over time effects. Lavos can use his passive to prolong crowd control effects like cold and radiation, which I think is very useful, and he can also use it to make gas clouds linger longer, which is especially helpful when used in conjunction with his catalyze ability. Because Lavos can imbue elements for his abilities, he can use the elements that most noticeably benefit from the stat very easily and work them into his ability casts. You can technically reduce your own status duration if you let the duration stat fall below 100%, but I don't think it's terribly difficult to prevent that from happening, especially with how good Archon continuity is on Lavos. 
Now, I think the status immunity for energy orbs, elemental imbuement, and increased status duration all speak for themselves as useful effects. The cooldown thing, though, is very subject to how the user feels. Personally, I absolutely love it. I think it makes Lavos a very interesting frame to play and gives him a fun depth by making you think about when and how you use your abilities, which, on top of his elemental imbuement, makes him very rewarding when you execute things well. I know several people hate this mechanic, and I think that's a fair opinion, but I love it and think Lavos is more fun for having it. So, with all his benefits considered, and admittedly because it's my list, I'm putting Lavos in S tier. Easy status immunity, boosted duration on status effects, elemental imbuement, and a unique gameplay loop via his cooldowns all wrap him up into a very fun, rewarding, and versatile package. I adore the way this character is designed, and I think people absolutely should play him more, especially with the recent addition of Valence Formation. Okay, enough shilling, let's move on. Sevagoth. Sevagoth's passive is, tragically, another on-death effect, and I think it's probably the worst one. Whenever Sevagoth dies, he becomes a tombstone and deploys his shadow, which has to kill five enemies in order to revive Sevagoth. The shadow can only either block or use the consume ability, though it is modified to instantly kill any enemy it hits so long as they don't have overguard or some special damage reduction. Because this technically puts Sevagoth in bleed out, he can be revived by allies during it, but will outright die in arbitrations. This passive also prevents Sevagoth from using Last Gasp, which depending on your focus school can actually make the self-reviving much more difficult, as stuff like Unairu and Matarai can do it very safely and easily. This is also technically the case for Anaros, but all he has to do is just hit enemies, so I think it isn't as bad for him. My main issue with this passive is probably pretty obvious by now, but yeah, I don't like that its activation condition is dying, especially because Sevagoth has Gloom, which is one of the best healing abilities in the entire game. What baffles me about this beyond just being tied to Sevagoth dying is that Sevagoth does have a meter that could easily be used for a passive, that being the Deathwell. Unlike Baruch though, who gets some benefit for holding on to his meter, Deathwell only serves as a timer for Exalted Shadow, which just makes it feel like a wasted opportunity to me. There are plenty of viable Sevagoth builds that don't use the Shadow, so much so that you could argue that going from Sevagoth to Shadow is like switching from Sheik to Zelda in Melee. But if you aren't using the Shadow, this meter does nothing, and Sevagoth is left with no usable passive outside of when he dies, and even in that case, he can make it arguably harder for him to self-revive. I do want to clarify that I think the Shadow is pretty fun in his own right, but with the addition of Sevagoth's 1 and 2 augments, he can very comfortably play the game without him. Or the player, honestly, these Shadows just play the damn game for you. All that said, this one's going in D tier for me. Activates only on death and grants no other bonuses while alive, also making it potentially harder to self-revive in the process. My suggestion for improvement? All I want is the death well to grant a passive bonus to Sevagoth for keeping it full. My idea is that Sevagoth should get some amount of ability efficiency based on how full the well is, capping out at like 20 or 30 percent. A lot of my suggestions, again, have just been for fun, but much like Excalibur, this is one I do feel pretty strongly about and I think would go a long way in improving the character, while also playing into the stats their kit values. Yureli Yureli's passive is the Critical Flow buff, which grants her 200% more critical chance for her secondary so long as she's been moving for at least 1.5 seconds. This bonus is added in with Critical Chance mods, and Yureli has a 1 second grace period if she stops moving where she can start moving again and not lose the bonus. Because Marilina forces Yureli to use her secondary, as she's a K-Drive, this basically grants Yureli a free 200% crit chance mod for doing almost nothing, and that bonus is granted to the weapon she cares about the most, her pistol. If you're using Marilina Guardian, this effect is not as valuable, but I still think it's very strong even when she's not purely bound to her secondary. Honestly though, I feel like bumping into every piece of geometry on Marilina is just part of the Yureli experience. I can't bring myself to use Marilina Guardian, because when I equip Yureli, I'm mentally no longer playing Warframe, I'm playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater with War Crimes. I know that's just a me thing, but that's just how I look at it. Regardless of that though, this buff grants Yureli a big crit bonus on her most important weapon for moving around, something you'll pretty much always be doing. This one goes up in S tier for the same reason as Zephyr. Easy to access and almost always helpful while fitting perfectly with how her kit functions. Not much more I have to say about it. Caliban Caliban's passive is Adaptive Armor, which grants Caliban and allies in affinity range 5% reduction to the strongest damage type an attack contained, up to 50% at 10 hits. If Caliban or any affected ally doesn't take any damage from said damage type for 5 seconds, then the bonus begins to decay at a rate of 2% per second until it goes away completely, though taking damage from that type again will reset this timer and add another 5% damage resistance. 
This passive isn't exactly bad, it's a free 50% damage reduction and it applies to everyone near Caliban, but it does have some major drawbacks. For starters, the 50% damage reduction is actually kind of misleading, as it only grants that reduction to the damage type that most makes up an attack. You see, in Warframe, damage is actually an aggregate of all of a weapon's damage types, and this applies to both player and enemy attacks. So, for example, if an enemy deals 100 damage and that attack is 80% puncture, 15% slash, and 5% impact, adaptive armor will only adapt to the puncture damage, as it's the most represented damage type. So our attack deals 80 puncture, 15 slash, 5 impact. And with full stacks of adaptive armor, that would deal 40 puncture, 15 slash, and 5 impact. You might notice this means the attack will deal a total of 60 damage, which isn't exactly 50% of that original 100. This gets even worse the more evenly split the damage types are, as if we, for example, had an attack that was 40% slash and 30% impact and puncture, only the slash would be reduced while leaving the other damage types intact, even if the slash gets so low that the other damage types actually make up more damage than it does. So if we apply those values to our 100 damage attack, then 50% resistance to slash would make the attack deal 20 slash, 30 puncture, and 30 impact. Again, even though slash is now the lowest value, adaptive armor will not adapt to the other two damage types. This results in 80 total damage, which is only a 20% reduction. These are all of course example figures, and the in-game performance will vary, but as a general rule, adaptive armor will very rarely actually grant a full 50% damage reduction, only really doing so if an attack is either solely one damage type, like with a flamethrower, or if multiple different weapons with differing highest damage types all contribute to adaptive armor separately. Also, just to note it here, adaptation also works this way. So beyond just that drawback, adaptive armor also shares another quirk with adaptation. Damage over time from procs like Heat and Toxin do not contribute to or maintain the damage reduction of adaptive armor. Unlike adaptation though, the enemy actually has to deal damage for adaptive armor to add or maintain a stack, so blocking damage or being invincible both won't add to it. Most noteworthy of all though is that adaptation outright overrides this passive, so if Caliban or his allies are using it, this passive just straight up doesn't do anything. Like I said, this passive isn't exactly bad, and Caliban sharing it with his team is a very nice trait to have, but its extensive drawbacks and proclivity towards being overwritten makes it pretty niche. As such, I'm putting it in C tier, though this absolutely may change if DE makes any adjustments with Caliban's upcoming rework. If such does happen, check the pinned comments for my updated thoughts. Gyre Gyre's passive grants all of her abilities a flat 10% critical chance per electric status affecting enemies they hit. This grants them 2 times more damage on a yellow crit, 3 times more damage on an orange crit at 11 stacks or more, and 4 times more damage on a red crit at 21 stacks or more, though this does cap out at 300% critical chance. This means that double, triple, and so forth red crits are not possible with this passive. This also stacks on top of the critical chance boost from Cathode Grace, meaning that Gyre functionally needs a much lower amount of electric procs to reach that cap as it starts scaling from the value of her 3. Because all of Gyre's abilities inflict the electric status, she's able to give herself a considerable increase in ability damage just for using her abilities. While this passive is very strong, I do think that it having a cap of 300% kinda sucks as it stalls out its ability to scale. My thought process was that if the enemy had survived an electric attack, you could just keep ramping up procs until they got to such a high crit tier they would eventually succumb, but because of that cap, that just doesn't really happen past a certain point. I also feel like it's easy to think this passive is better than it actually is because of the Cathode Grace bonus, which in reality does do a lot of the heavy lifting. I also want to note that, as you might expect, subsumed abilities do not benefit from this passive. All that considered, I think this is an A tier passive. It isn't outright broken, but it absolutely works well within Jire's kit and gives her a solid DPS increase. I think her 3 kind of overshadows it, and without that 3 the higher bonuses would take a lot longer to hit, but it's still very strong in its own right. Styanax. Styanax's passive grants him a buff called Hoplite, which gives him 1% more critical chance to all of his weapons for every 40 shields he currently has, including overshields. This bonus is doubled to 2% for every 40 shields, specifically on spear guns, and is additive with critical chance mods. Because I put both Yoreli and Zephyr so high, you'll probably expect me to put this one in S tier, but I don't really think it belongs there. You see, Styanax is a Warframe who spams his 4th ability a lot, meaning that for most players you're not going to be taking advantage of the buff all too often because you aren't really using your weapons. Obviously you can play a weapon focused Styanax to get around this, but that presents its own issues. To start, it takes a lot of shields to get high values out of this buff, which is very noteworthy. I mean, to put it into perspective, if Styanax wanted to get a bonus as high as Zephyr's, he'd need 6,000 shields to do so, 
though for a spear gun specifically, he'd need only 3,000. His rally point generates shields and overshields, so he can use that to help bolster his shield count, but then there's another thing to consider. You remember how I said it scales based on his current shield count? Well, if Cyanax ever loses his shields, the buff goes away entirely, and as they reduce, it also goes down in effectiveness. Fortunately for him, his Intrepid Stand augment makes his shield pool very easy to protect with Overguard, but if you're doing that, then you're using his 4 often, which means you aren't taking advantage of the buff. I'm gonna put this one in B tier. It's a very strong effect for sure, but it takes a lot of investment to build up, is easy to lose without Overguard, and doesn't really play into Steinax's typical game plan of using his ultimate as much as possible. To its credit though, you can build some interesting alternative strategies around it, and it is strong by the numbers regardless. Varuna Varuna is interesting because she actually has four passives, so this is gonna take us a bit to get through. So, Varuna's first passive, tied to Dinar, increases her parkour velocity by 55%. This is a pretty sizable boost, and when combined with a sprint speed bonus from Shroud of Dinar, makes her very, very fast. Add on things like parkour velocity shards, and you can make her one of the fastest frames in the entire game with parkour maneuvers. Her second passive, tied to Raksh, makes her status immune. I'm serious, she's just straight up status immune. For free. This passive is honestly so good it would put Varuna in S tier by itself, and we've still got two more to go. Varuna's third passive, tied to Lycaf, gives her a flat 100% heavy attack efficiency. Though, funnily enough, this is effectively only 90%, as that's the cap for the stat. You'd only ever really notice this if you used a Riven with a minus heavy attack efficiency stat. Considering how powerful Shroud of Dinar's melee buff is, this lets Varuna access a playstyle revolving around high combo heavy attacks, which is something a lot of frames can't do nearly as easily without using Tenokai. Now, to be fair, Tenokai is really good, so this passive isn't as strong as it used to be, but it's still solid. The last buff, tied to Ulfrun, is the worst in my opinion. Basically, it does nothing as long as it's active, but if Varuna were to die while it's on, she's granted 3 seconds of invincibility and full health and shields, and the passive goes on a 60 second cooldown, with this cooldown also being incurred if she switches off the passive to a different one. This has the same issue to me as all the other on-death passives, though it doesn't enter bleed out which is nice, but it's especially bad here because all of her other options are just so much better. You can switch to it if you expect you're about to die, like say you've been lifted by mania and you're just awaiting your funeral, but in general I don't think it's that valuable. Still, all of Aruna's other passives make her an easy S tier on account of both their raw power and the versatility of being able to swap them out whenever she wants. Citrine Citrine's passive grants her and allies within 50 meters the Geoluminescence buff, which grants a passive 5 health per second at base. I shit you not, this passive is better than Titania's in both range and healing, and Citrine literally has to do nothing for it. But it gets even better. Every time Citrine picks up a health orb, she adds 0.1 health per second to this buff, maxing out at 25 health per second when 200 health orbs are collected. Because Citrine's Fractured Blast makes enemies drop health orbs, this buff isn't terribly difficult to stack so long as you're using her one frequently. Which, you're Citrine, so you probably are. I also want to note that the 50 meter range on this buff is the same as Affinity Sharing Range, but it doesn't actually use Affinity Sharing Range as its own range, so things like Phosphors and Bazarin won't boost the range of the buff. It's 50 meters flat, and that's it, though that is still a decent distance. Now, if I'm perfectly honest, even at the full 25 health per second, this buff isn't anything insane by itself. With how much damage you can take in Warframe, healing buffs often have to be north of 100 health per second to be able to reliably keep you from dying, unless you have a lot of armor. So while the 25 health per second is free, it's not enough to save you on its own. But that's the thing, it's not saving you on its own, and that's because of Citrine's second ability, Preserving Shell. Because Preserving Shell reduces the damage that Citrine and allies take by up to 90%, the 25 health per second is a lot more impactful, because you're not actually losing nearly as much health each time you get hit, which makes the passive buff much more effective in practice. Weird thing I want to note about this though, Preserving Shell also has a 50 meter range, but that actually is affected by affinity range boosts, which is kinda unintuitive. I do want to point out, in the name of fairness, that Citrine's ability to print health orbs with her 1 makes her passive less useful, which, again, as a Citrine, you're probably using her 1 a lot. Thing is, you can't really control your teammates, and it's not uncommon that they won't be paying you a visit and grabbing those orbs, so having a way to sustain them without any effort is nice, especially in conjunction with that damage reduction. All that said, this one's going in A tier. Not broken, but works well in the context of the kit and is over 6 times more effective than Titania's passive. Damn dude, that's rough. Stalker. This one will probably surprise a lot of people, but yes, Stalker actually has a passive, and even more interestingly, it's insanely good. 
So, whenever Stalker attacks an enemy who's unaware of him, he gains 300% more critical chance against that enemy. This unawareness counts if the enemy is unalerted, or much more accessibly, if Stalker is invisible, which he can do with his smokescreen. This 300% is added in with critical chance mods, and affects not only Stalker's weapons, but also his abilities. You see, normally whenever you cast Stalker's ultimate, Punishment, it breaks his stealth. Funny thing is, you can just recast the invisibility during the cast, which actually allows the Punishment projectiles to crit. This is really cool, though it kind of feels unintentional, but yellow number equals more dopamine, so I'll take what I can get. For the same reasons as Zephyr and Yorelli, Stalker is going in S tier. A huge crit bonus to everything simply for being invisible, which Stalker is going to be doing constantly anyways. Now, this is kind of a side tangent, but the biggest thing holding Stalker back is honestly the fact that we can't mod him. I mean, look at this. Why the fuck are you using Umbral Vitality and Fiber? You have an invis, why would things be damaging you? Same thing for Arcane Grace here, when would you be triggering this? If we were able to actually put together loadouts with Stalker, I think we could find a lot of cool ways to leverage this passive, especially with things like Arcane Trickery and Unseen Dread, but as it stands, we can't really do that. I feel like that's actually partially why Stalker's passive is so powerful. You can't really build around it, so the buff has to be really big. I don't know, I just wish we could take him into normal missions. Though I get why we can't. I can dream, though. Colorvo. Colorvo's passive grants him 75% more heavy attack efficiency and 100% more heavy attack wind-up speed, no strings attached. Similarly to Varuna's Lycath passive, this passive is kind of overshadowed by the addition of Tenokai, but I think that the way Colorvo's entire kit works makes it much better in practice than it is on Varuna. Colorvo's whole kit revolves around building combo to spread and deal huge damage, and this passive enables that playstyle. This one is really made amazing by the kit surrounding it, because Colorvo is able to do full combo heavy attack builds way more easily than anybody else. Because Recompense and Storm of Uko contribute to the combo counter, and Chained Enemies with Collective Curse also add to the counter, Colorvo can rack up combo insanely fast. He can then use his first ability, Wrathful Advance, to use that combo for huge damage. Because his passive grants a 75% boost in efficiency though, you're able to spam this with very little punishment, and in combination with his fast combo gain, he's able to use full combo heavies with a massive crit chance boost incredibly liberally. You can do Tenokai builds for full combo heavies, sure, but Colorvo can spam them without any light attack setup or randomness in their activation, which is super valuable. I think you can validly argue this one goes in A, but because of how pivotal it is to Colorvo's kit, I'm putting it in S. It suits what Colorvo wants to do perfectly and makes him the best at it, bar none. You could also be based and play Sniper Colorvo, which would ignore this passive entirely, but that that's forbidden knowledge. Dagath. Dagath's passive, called Endless Abyss, grants her a 35% chance whenever she picks up a health or energy orb to increase that orb's effectiveness by 300%, or in other words, it multiplies its effectiveness by 4 times. Unlike Arcane Energizer Pulse, this passive has no cooldown, and it also triggers after boosts to orb effectiveness from things like Amber Shards. So, for example, if I pick up a normal energy orb that grants 25 energy, then Endless Abyss will increase it to 100 energy. If I were to have on two Amber Shards for 100% more energy orb effectiveness though, this would make the energy orb grant 50 energy, which means that Endless Abyss will multiply off of that new value and give me 200 energy. I do want to mention that this bonus doesn't apply with Equilibrium, so if I pick up a health orb and get a bunch of extra health from the passive, I won't then get a bunch of extra energy. Still, this passive grants a ton of extra health and energy on roughly one third of all orb pickups with absolutely zero cooldown. I'd argue it's a built-in side grade to Energize, as while Energize grants a flat 150 energy outright and has a 60% activation chance, it's offset by its 15 second cooldown. Unlike Energizer Pulse though, Endless Abyss only affects Dagath, not being shared with teammates. So this passive is essentially a built-in side grade to probably the best Warframe Arcane in the entire game. This is especially useful on Dagath specifically because she's a caster frame, meaning she's going to be using her abilities a lot, so the extra energy is extremely useful. The health component is less impactful in my own experience, but Dagath is pretty fragile, so it definitely helps at least a bit. All told, this one is another S tier if you ask me. It's a no cooldown, 4 times orb effectiveness modifier on a 35% chance, on a character who can print health orbs no less. Very, very good, unless you're using Equilibrium or Purple Shards, in which case it's just okay, but that's not the point. Corvex. Corvex's passive, called Core Exposure, grants him 3 meters of punch through to his primary and secondary weapons, as well as certain melees like Gunblades and his ultimate, Crucible Blast. 
This passive is really interesting because, while it doesn't really play into a laser-focused Corvex playstyle that much, it does allow Corvex to explore an alternate gun-focused playstyle. This 3 meters of punch through makes him very good at using weapons that are normally single target, especially when used with his containment wall, which lines up enemies and makes them more vulnerable to damage, even armor stripping them if wrecking wall is used. If you're using an AoE weapon, focusing on ability kills, or using a weapon with infinite body punch through, this passive doesn't really do that much, but if you choose to play around it, it gives Corvex a very unique and fun alternative playstyle. This is especially good for secondary weapons, which don't really have any easy access to punch through, letting weapons like Piranha Prime, for example, tear through groups of enemies even more effectively than before. So, this passive is going in C tier. This may seem kind of low, but I want to make it clear I don't think this passive is bad at all. It's a cool and creative way to play Corvex, but by my own tier list definitions, I think it belongs in C tier, especially because it doesn't really come into play at all if using certain weapons or focusing on Crucible Blast. Hey, Editing Cool Kid here again. I know I've kind of already finished this section, but I wanted to step in and clarify something I didn't really explain that well. I know several of you are probably confused that I said this passive doesn't really mesh with a beam-focused Corvex, considering a huge part of that playstyle is hitting multiple enemies with the beam. So doesn't this passive then enable that playstyle? That's a totally fair assertion, but weirdly enough, it's not actually accurate. You see, Corvex's Crucible Blast actually has infinite body punch through, which is a somewhat rare mechanic where a projectile can pierce an infinite number of enemies, but no terrain. Felarchs and Alternox are both good demonstrations of this mechanic. Because of that fact, all the passive really does for Crucible Blast is let it shoot through up to 3 meters of terrain. This is honestly really cool, but it isn't that practical all things considered. You can normally see the enemies you're shooting at with the laser, and even if you can't, it's not uncommon for them to die to the chain reaction explosions anyways. Really neat, and honestly really fun if you know it exists, it's just not that practical. Okay, I hope that clears that up, let's get back on track. Dante. Dante's passive grants him a buff known as Chronicler's Mark, where he gains 50% more status chance against all enemies that he has fully scanned into the Codex, with this bonus being additive with mods. This passive is kinda weird to me because I feel like it's a weird combination of both decent and unimpressive, and I'm going to try to articulate why. On the one hand, this passive's boost in status chance plays into Dante's goals. He inflicts a lot of status effects with Noctua, his birds increase status chance and damage, and Tragedy helps him leverage the DOT effects he inflicts. At the same time though, 50% isn't really all that much, and his birds do grant a sizable bonus by themselves. Some people will also probably find the Codex requirement annoying, but as Noctua scans enemies it kills into the Codex, I find it's really not that big of a deal. This is technically also listed in Dante's passive, so I guess I have to count it as part of it, but it's only really helpful up until you fully scan the enemy, after which it doesn't really mean anything. The status chance also affects not just Noctua, but also Word Warden, which is helpful as they both have pretty high status chance and slash damage, making the book satellite even better. So, this strategy does play into Dante's goals of inflicting status effects to set up for tragedy, but the buff is just really mediocre. As such, I'm putting it in C tier. It's not quite bad enough to be in D tier in my opinion, but it just isn't that impactful regardless. Does this have any glaring weaknesses or enable any niche strategies like other things in C tier? Not really, no. Is it technically always helpful and plays into his mechanics? Sure, but it's so mediocre it just hardly matters. I would appreciate this passive if it was a better bonus, like maybe 100% added with mods or even a flat 50% increase, but it isn't, so it gets to live down here in C. Jade. Finally on to the last frame as of this video's making, we have Jade. Jade's passive is another two-parter, kind of, so we'll start with the easy part. Jade can equip two different aura mods at once, which is already very, very good on its own. This lets her get a huge boost in mod capacity, ranging anywhere from 28 to 36 more in total, though that's more of a convenience thing than anything. This allows her to take powerful combinations though, like growing power and corrosive projection to boost her armor strip, and as she has two auras, they're both affected by coaction drift. These auras also affect the whole team, so she's able to passively support them without really doing anything. The other part of Jade's passive is one I actually don't entirely agree with being a passive, that being her judgments. Whenever an enemy touches Jade's Light's judgment radius, they'll receive a judgment, and this can also happen if they're hit by Glory at a 10% chance. Judgment makes enemies take 50% more damage to health, shields, and overguard for 10 seconds, and they can be detonated by Glory into a radial explosion. This is obviously also very good, so where's my disagreement with it? Well, while I have no qualms with it as a mechanic, I do think that considering it a passive is just… kinda odd. Like, she has to use one of those two abilities in order to actually trigger it, 
so I don't really feel like it's much of a passive effect. If she could inflict it at a 10% chance on any hit, not just Glory, I feel like it'd make more sense to call it a passive. I know some people might call me hypocritical for this because Grendel's passive is also accessed through an ability, but because his stomach is a central mechanic to his kit, I feel like it makes more sense to have a buff tied to it. Kind of the same vein with Lavos, but as his imbuement affects all of his abilities, I think it also makes more sense there. Because it's listed as a passive in-game, I'm going to count it, but I just wanted to make my opinion known there. So, where do we place our final Warframe for this video? Well, I'm putting it right up in S tier with the best of the best. Her passive provides double the effortless support to her allies, and while I do have my issues with calling Judgments part of her passive, they are undeniably a very powerful boost in damage while also giving her access to her glory nuke. If I wasn't counting the Judgments, I'd probably put this in A tier, but because the game counts them, it's going in S. Alright, we finally made it to the end of the video. If you're still watching, feel free to comment Chalky Chair to let me know that you've made it this far. I know I'm recycling this from Weird Obscure Season 1, but my goal is to see if anybody will actually get the extremely niche reference, so I'm recasting the net. Also, if you're watching this in the future where Jade isn't the most recent Warframe, do keep an eye on the pinned comment. I'm going to be updating it over time as new frames get added and old ones get reworked to try and keep things up to date. So if you want my thoughts on Kome or Saito9 or whoever else might be out right now, take a look down there. While we're on the topic of comments, do feel free to let me know your thoughts on this list and what you'd change about it, as well as any passive reworks you'd give to the frames in the lower tiers. I've left a tier maker in the description if you want to make your own, and I'll do my best to keep it updated as new frames are added as well. Again, I ask that you be civil, this is just people sharing their thoughts about a video game, and it's really not that serious. Okay, with all that out of the way, I gotta do my shilling any percent run. So, like, comment, subscribe, join the Discord, watch the streams, and send termites to your local town hall. Huge thank you to all of my members for supporting the channel, I appreciate you all very, very much, and a huge thanks to you for watching. I hope you've learned a thing or two, and I'll see you all again next time with my next small project that ends up taking me a month to make. <laughs>